Welcome to the Get More Success Show. He's a guy who never measured a man's success by the size of his wife. Uh, let's get ready to rumble! It's showtime. 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 It's showtime. Showtime! Let's go! And now, here is your host, Warwick Merry. Welcome back to another episode of Get More Success. Today, I am thrilled uh, to be talking with uh, a friend of mine all the way from America. Now, he has been uh, published in USA Today, Forbes, Fox Business, Huffington Post, been on TV like you wouldn't believe. He is the very own Chief Amazement Officer, Shep Hyken. Welcome to the show. Hey, that's me, and it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Hey, uh, I'm going to start off just by asking the question that I ask everyone who comes on the show. How do you define success, whether it be personal or professional, or maybe there's a different definition, but how do you define success? By height. (laughs) (laughs) Um, You know, that's, I think success is, is really defined by fulfillment and fulfillment. Now that's another story. Uh, fulfillment in business, I sometimes define it as numbers, you know, the, the dollars that we bring in, number of speaking engagements. So there's, there's different metrics, if you will, to define business success. Again, personal success, I go back to fulfillment. Am I happy? Uh, one of my, my I guess I, I am a, a guy that writes down my goals. I go back to them and look at them quite often. And I have five main goals lifetime goals, if you will, life, you know, I I don't want to call them goals, but they're aspirations. And I want to live a thousand years, which means I want to not necessarily live to be a thousand years old, but I want to have the experiences of somebody that's lived just a full, full life. And I want to play golf on my 100th birthday. I want to have lots of friends. I want to have a sound mind. So I want to stay healthy. So those are, to me, that would define success. If at the end of my life, you know, it was, you know, uh, several years after my 100th birthday, because I think I'm healthy enough to play golf at 100. I'm probably going to live another few years at least. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I hope my, some of my friends are still there to, to be with me. Hopefully you'll be there. I'll be the caddy. But, but there you go. Now, that would be cool. Your goal should be to caddy on my 100th birthday. That sounds fantastic. Hey, so, Shep, give us a bit of a background because there's a lot of people listening who aren't quite aware of who you are. Um, as a chief amazement officer, you're, I mean, like you've published three or four books and your focus is all about customer service, but you have a real twist on it because of your magical background, so to speak. So give us a bit of a, just a bit of history on who is Shep Hyken. Sure. I'll try to do it in less than 60 seconds. I started off as a magician and I did birthday parties when I was just a little kid and I worked my way into nightclubs. In college, I had a regular job, still working in nightclubs, graduated college. The company I was working for that I thought I would work for the rest of my life, they sold uh, not even five months out of college, four or five months, the guy said, hey, we're going to sell the company. And sure enough, a few months later, it was gone. And I didn't know what to do. So saw a couple of motivational speakers. I said, that's what I can do. Uh, they, they were great on stage. I had the entertainment background, so I knew I could get up there. I had a little business background. I felt confident, wrote a speech, started researching and realized everything that I really enjoyed reading about had to do with customer service and anything related to that genre. And that's how it all started 30 plus years ago, 1983. So you've now been working with some some big names, like just to start with the A's, American Airlines, AAA, Anheuser-Busch, AT&T, Edna Abbott, no, American Express, you know, and I'm sure it goes on all the way to the Z's or Z's. There's a few, there's a few more, yeah. <laughs> um, so from a customer service point of view, because, you know, businesses always talk about customer service. Some of them only talk about it, others do it. Mm -hmm. successful customer service. Wow. And, you know, again, every company has to define what they believe successful customer services. I mean, if you go into a fancy hotel that, you know, high dollar, high end, they're going to define it completely different than maybe a big box store uh, or, you know, and over here in the States we have, you know, like Walmart, you're going to get a completely different service experience. Yet their definition of service might be just friendly smiles and friendly people versus you know, a high-end company might be lots of people making sure customers never have to wait, always enough people to take care of them. Of course, you pay for that service too. Mm. So um, I would say this, the customer defines what the success is of the company. The company can only hope to deliver on what they promise to that customer. 
So with with these companies who are trying to deliver this this great service, and and by the way, I once heard one of the hardest industries to give good service in would be like a three star hotel or three star a three star hotel because it's it's like we don't want to give five star service because we're only a three star hotel. So it's that how do you balance that? Um, but the the question I have for you is what are what are the biggest barriers in giving that customer service? What do they need to do yeah. to, to get there? Well, let's, let, I want to hit that question, but I want to go back to your three-star comment. Yeah. I once stayed at a very low-end, inexpensive hotel. Basically, it's, it's a comfort inn, and I'm not sure they have comfort inns over where you are, but that's a chain of relatively low-priced hotels. I'm going to say my room rate that night might have been $59. US dollars. Doesn't sound like much, does it? Yet when I walked in, the person greeting me was so friendly. And then she says, I know we don't have any fancy mints on the pillow, but here's what we do have. And she pulls out a basket filled with jumbo sized candy bars. And like, so I took a Snickers, you know, and that Snickers at the store cost $2. And I'm thinking to myself, they just spent like 4% of the cost of me staying there on a candy bar for me to have, you know, and I thought, wow. That's pretty good. And of course you get into the room and you know, you got carpet and you know, it's probably old. It's not fluffy. The towels aren't as thick as the Ritz Carlton or the Four Seasons, but you know what? It was really nice. And the people were so darn friendly at the end of the day, like a Walmart. Okay. You have to deliver friendly service, not necessarily at the same level. So a three-star hotel could still be a good hotel to stay yeah. at. All right. So back to the original question, which was, I believe, what? How you measure it? So how, how, what are the barriers in giving good oh, service or successful service? Sure. I think there's, there's a couple of barriers. Number one is leadership. Leadership is definitely an impediment to good service if they haven't defined it properly and leadership doesn't live and fulfill what the service mantra is. In other words, you can't tell people to do one thing and expect uh, if you're not behaving a certain way for them to go out and do it. Walt Disney was a great example of a person that walked the talk, so to speak. He called it stooping to excellence. He, he would walk through his theme park and see a piece of paper on the ground. He'd pick it up and throw it away because he knew that if he walked by that piece of paper, he gave permission to everyone else to walk by it. So leadership has to define it. They have to act it and demonstrate it. The second barrier is the people that work at the company. So the right people have to be hired. And most importantly, even if they are the right people, they have to be trained properly. And I think that's where some companies work really hard to get the right people and then drop it there and don't do the proper training. Sure, we did onboarding training and we gave them customer service as part of that. But any type of training, especially with the relationship building skills of service and even sales, it's, it needs to be constantly reinforced. So it's not, training isn't something that you did, it's something that you do all the time. And I think that's a big impediment to success, a barrier to their success. So with, you know, a lot of organizations talk about, oh, yes, we do customer service training and the leadership will talk about, oh, customer service is really important. But there is a bit of a disconnect because sometimes the leaders will think, well, what customer service is for other people. That's only for frontline staff. Yeah. What are your yeah. thoughts on internal customer service? So, I, first of all, internal customer service is probably what, what got me where I am today because back in the early 80s, when I was starting to develop customer service and service became hot and many speakers started to do this topic, I said, what could differentiate myself? And I thought, well, how about if I do a big focus on internal service, treating people the way you work, who you work with the way you want a customer treated. And I think that's a huge piece of it. So a couple of things. Number one, to the leadership, get this and get it real clear. Customer service is not a department. It's not just for the front line. It is for everyone. It is a philosophy and it's the philosophy of your brand. And that means everyone has to stay on board. And that means the people in the warehouse or the accounting department who never ever talk to a customer to the front line, from the CEO to the most recently hired person. Everybody needs to understand what the service vision is and they need to deliver either to the external customer or somebody that they support internally. And if it's somebody in the warehouse, even though they may never talk to a customer, when they get an order and they go over and start picking things off the shelf and putting it into a box, they need to understand if they box it wrong and it shows up broken because they didn't properly wrap something that was fragile or maybe they left an item out. 
they have a huge impact on the customer. Even though they never directly interact, they never talk to this customer, but they have a big impact on it. So uh, Jan Carlson years ago, who wrote the book Moments of Truth back in the mid 1980s, he said, if you're not actually supporting somebody that is, uh, you know, if you're not actually uh, doing something directly for a customer, you're probably supporting somebody that is. So there's a lot of people who talk about um, millennials and, and uh, younger people coming on board. Oh, they, 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 they're they all wrapped up in their mobile phone. They don't have the right attitude. They're all focused on themselves. What's your experience been like? You've been out with these big companies who obviously have these millennials frontline staff. Yeah. Are there any differences or are there any issues with now with technology, how so many people seem to be glued to their phones all the time that are impacting on customer service? And in so how, what do we do about it? Wow, that, so that's a huge question. And the number one uh, part of it is, is it really millennials or is it everybody? And I think it, to a degree, it's everybody. It's not just millennials. You're stereotyping or people tend to stereotype millennials a certain way. The reality is millennials are a different generation and there will be another generation after that, and another one. And, and the further you get apart, so there's, there's a big gap between boomers and, and millennials, okay? And that's that whole Gen X, Y group that's in yep. there. Um, and that's fine. Okay. So, but at the same time, boomers are just, I had somebody working in my office. She, she was just as guilty as getting on her cell phone in the middle of the day and doing whatever is, you know, she was older as somebody that's younger. It, it doesn't really make any difference, but here's where the mindset shifts. Number one, millennials want to be fulfilled. That's partially because as parents, and I'm, I'm amazed it's happened almost on a worldwide level, at least in, in the, the, what I would call the more progressive countries that we've treated this generation uh, across the world almost identically. We've empowered them to make certain decisions, such as when, our, when I was growing up, my parents, and I don't know about yours work, but my parents, uh, they, they were lifers. Uh, my dad had a career, and sure, he was a bit of an entrepreneur, but overall, what he did, he was a lifer. And many of my friends' uh, parents worked for a company for 30, 40 plus years and re started in that company and retired in that company. And I remember being told, you know, you, as I was starting to develop my career, you know, you don't have to work for one company. You can see how it is and move on. Well, now we're just really empowering young people to do that. I think it's actually not a bad thing. I think it ups the game for everybody because if we're going to know that you're potentially going to leave in six months or a year because this isn't for you, we're gonna do a lot better job of hiring people to make sure that this is a job for you. So that's a good thing for both sides. The bar is raised. And I don't think it looks very good if somebody shows up five years into their business career and has 12 jobs. Oh, I was just finding out what I like to do. Well, am I gonna be the next victim of that little way of thinking? You know, so, uh, but as far as customer service goes, uh, I think the bottom line is uh, the millennial generation wants to be appreciated more so than the older generations. That's very important to them. And if you appreciate them and you fulfill them, they will go to the mat for you just as any other good employee would. They just have a little bit of a different need. As far as being connected, this is how they grew up. Uh, you know, I don't know about you, but because uh, I think you're what, in your mid-30s? Late 40s, but thanks for being so kind. <laughs> just trying to be nice. Okay. <laughs> so, but I know when I was a kid, there were four television channels. Now there's 400 television channels. You know, the phone was something we dialed. Okay. I just today received phone books that were delivered to my office. And I thought, what are these doing here? <laughs> I guess this is what happened when the computer crashes and Google goes down. Yeah. I don't know. It's like my backup plan. Or I need to start a fire later on in my fireplace. Something to prompt your computer to out with. Yeah. So the thing is, is that there's still that the, the, the way we do business is so much different today with technology. The kids were born and are born today with phones practically in their hands. Don't expect to tell them to put it away from them when it's just as important as wearing underwear to them. Yeah. Uh, and that's and I think that's the thing is that we have to adapt um, or we have to adapt our processes and the way we operate to uh a life for them, you know, whereas as you say, I've, there's some of my clients, they're like, Oh, we have a no mobile phones at work policy. And it, it like, it, it just creates this loathing of work from the younger generation because they feel disconnected for the eight hours that they're there. Right. I mean, you know, we have a policy here. It's like, if you're going to use technology, it's for business purposes. Hey, 
you know, you're going to take lunch. We, I, and by the way, at lunch, if you want to jump on your computer and check out Facebook, I don't care. I just don't want to walk in the middle of the afternoon when you're supposed to be working on something else and see you real quickly turn off the, you know, the, the page that had your Facebook that you were working. That would really bother me. <laughs> but I, I recognize today, you know, same thing with phones. Hey, your phone's there. If somebody needs you and it's important, take the call. Okay. But you know what? If you're talking to your friends, your family, your sister, your brother, just checking in in the middle of the day on the time that we're paying you, you need to give us a little bit more respect. We'll res so here's my thing. I'm fairly flexible, but because there's other employees, we have to make sure there's a standard that's set. And if somebody's allowed to break the standard, then everybody else will relax their standards as well. So, I mean, everybody knows when the, when the line is being crossed. I think they're smart enough to know that. If they feel at all guilty, and they feel like they have to put it away when the boss comes by, they've probably crossed, uh, crossed the line. Yeah, yeah. So that, that's a really good question. You're the customer service expert. You're helping some of these other massive names on giving good customer service. So what about the hiking business? Like uh, how, because you've got to sort of extol, you've got to be better than everybody else. What are some <laughs> of the key things that, that you do to, to be able to provide that level of service? Right, I beat them until they're, no, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> Rule with an iron stop fish. Until your morale gets better. Okay. Yep. So, uh, what do we do? Well, first of all, I have a mantra. It's three words, and you probably know what it is. It's at the end of all my emails. Always be amazing. It's on my business cards. It's what I tell all my clients. It's what I tell my clients they're going to experience a level of amazing service. We practice what we preach, and we're going to teach you to deliver amazing service to the people that you work with or do business with. And Everybody here needs to be treated that way as well. So um, I would think that even though I'm a tough boss because we're a small company and, and I have a standard to keep and I am tough about keeping that standard, I think we're still pretty amazing. Um, an employee that just recently left me, sweet as can be, uh, you, you met her at the uh, conference mm -hmm. most likely. And she was with me for a while. She was struggling, had some issues, personal issues. We talked about what's making her happy. And you know we came to an agreement that this probably wasn't the job for her. The biggest reason was not because she wasn't good at it, she was very good, but she had moved from just a couple of miles away to almost 20 some odd miles away. When it's taking her an extra hour to and from work, mm -hmm. she didn't plan for that. Yeah. So all of a sudden, she's not happy and it's not because of the job. So we sit down and we say, you know, what's happening? And look, here's the deal. You're not happy, start looking for something else. I'm not letting you go, you get to choose. And it's like, how many bosses tell their people. Yeah. If you're not happy, I want you to go, but you don't have to go now until you find a job. Now, I did tell her that I was going to start looking. And if the perfect deal, they're all going to intersect. You know, if she finds her job, I found my person. And of course, she found her job faster than I found my person. <laughs> but that doesn't mean she left me high and dry. But the point I'm trying to make is that, you know, we cared enough to sit down and have a conversation. And I think that conversation that I had wouldn't happen with a lot of different managers or bosses. Yeah. Uh, it was really more of a heartfelt, I care about you kind of relationship, not just all business. And I think there's an emotional side to doing business with anybody. And this is important. Loyalty isn't about a number. It, I'm sure you can measure loyalty, but it's not about how much money you spend with me. It's about the engagement that I have. And when it comes time in a business sense, when it comes time for you to do business with someone else, you're going to care about me more you're going to do more business with me. You might even give me a shot before you decide to move your business elsewhere because you feel I deserve it because of this emotional connection, a relationship that we have. So, uh, and I always tell my clients, if you really want to look at it transactionally, which I don't like to look at, just look at it as a next time, every time transaction. What am I doing right now to make sure that the interaction, that's a better word, the interaction that I'm having with you is going to make you want to do business with me the next time you need what it is that I sell. For my employee, it's what am I doing right now to hope that you'll stay here the rest of your life? Yeah, yeah. And there are companies that believe in that, try to create lifers out of their employees. Yeah. You mentioned something before, which I've actually seen in action with you, and that is that you have high expectations, particularly of your own team. Um, um, we went out for dinner somewhere, and you had high expectations of the staff in the restaurant. How important is your expectation of service to the level of service that you get? So I am obviously looking at everything through a microscope, acutely aware of the flaws and the you know perfect service that I am given. And uh, if I'm going to spend a lot of money, uh, I expect a certain level of service, a certain level of quality. I know what I should get. 
And by the way, I'm not mean to anybody. Um, the other night I, I went out to dinner with uh, three couples. So, so there's eight of us total, four couples total, but three other couples. And we had a terrible meal at the most expensive restaurant in the city. And after it was all said and done, I walked over to the manager who knows me well, very well. He says, well, how was everything? I said, you know, I'm going to tell you the truth. Yep. I said, what do I usually tell you? You usually tell me you love us. Not tonight. He goes, really? And I went through a menu of what was wrong with that evening. And he was very appreciative. And he was, and I never berated anybody. I didn't yell at the server. I mean, here I am paying a really high amount of money for food, having to ask a couple of times for this empty glass of water to get refilled. Hey, can you, next time you come by, would you, you know, you just walk right by me the last time. And of course the guy was clueless that particular evening. Maybe the guy was having an off night. Maybe the kitchen was having an off night. It seemed everybody was having an off night that night. Point is, I have the expectation, but I'm nice enough. I will, you know, hopefully do it, per, you know, without being curt and yelling and, you know, making people feel bad. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, some customers, and I've, I've talked about this recently, I was one of those jerk customers once, and I learned the hard way. Um, and this is embarrassing. I had a huge speech. Um, I remember it was in New Orleans and probably about 10,000 people in the audience. I was the closing speaker. So about an hour after my speech, I'm heading to the airport. I get to the airport. Now, this is going to give you a, a time frame. I'm not going to tell you the name of the airline. The initials were TWA. So <laughs> TWA has been out of business for a long time. And it's not because they weren't good. It's because they merged in with American. Yeah. And it was back when there was a smoking section on the plane. Do you remember the difference between the non-smoking seats no. and the smoking seats? No, the, the smoke doesn't go, oh, Barry, can't go back there. I'll just Exactly. No, no, it's just, yeah, it's like the next seat is a smoking seat. So I always like to sit as far to the front as possible. And I booked my ticket as far to the front as possible. And I got to the airline, uh, to the airport. I got in. It's probably about another 10 minutes before the flight's going to leave. They boarded the flight for the most part. And I go up to get my ticket. And the gentleman says, there's one seat left on the plane. Just take it. I go, well, this is my seat. Well, I had to give that to somebody else. I, I go, you can't do that. The, la the seat that was available, and I asked, do you know where it is? He goes, yes, I do. It's toward the back of the plane. I said, that's in the smoking section. I don't smoke. And not only that, I'm sure. Now, well, I remember. It was between two big guys. It was a middle seat between two big guys, I think, named Bubba. <laughs> they, maybe they weren't named Bubba, but here's the point. I became upset. I go, no, I have a ticket. It says, I'm sitting here and I'm going to sit there. And the guy said, you've got a choice. You can get on the plane because I'm going to close that door in about five minutes. If you're not on the plane, it goes without you. Okay. But if you want to be on that plane, you go take that open seat. And I said, I want the seat that I paid for. And he wasn't going to relent and neither was I. And I lost my cool. And as people were sitting around watching, and I wasn't screaming at the guy, but it, there was no doubt. I had the finger going. I had the eyes, you know, the angry voice, but I was still low, you know. <laughs> and somebody, as I walked by, says, hey, weren't you the speaker that we had uh, this morning? And I went, oh, no. And I am here. <laughs> so there's the punchline of that, you know. I, I, it was pretty bad. I was embarrassed, and I said, this will never happen again yeah, yeah yeah and and having those service conversations um culturally in australia if you're at a restaurant or something and they say how is everything oh, it was fine even if it was horrible like no one is honest and says actually there was a couple of issues that you should be aware of because half the time the managers don't know right. so what are your so, thoughts I mean, on being able to give that kind of honest feedback yeah so i i i say do you really want to know now you know that the, the restaurant that I just described, which is one of my favorite restaurants in town, we go there all the time. And I went to the manager who knows me. He knows what I do for a living. He knows what I, you know, this is what I do. I, I, I write books on customer service. I train it. I speak it. I have great clients. He appreciated my positive feedback, positive yeah. in the sense that I did it in a positive way, not in a malicious, angry way. I wanted nothing. I didn't want a free meal. I didn't want him to take anything off the bill. I wanted my next experience to be better yeah. than the one I had today. Yeah, yeah. Um, so let's talk about non-businessy stuff. Now, I know you're a muso and you've got more guitars than you can poke a stick at. And obviously, just looking in the background, you're a bit of a sports fan. So in terms of success, how important is it for you to not do work stuff, to be able to just hang out with your mates and play a few tunes or take your lovely wife out somewhere? Like, how important is that kind of stuff? Well, you remember I talked to you about living a thousand years. Mm. Um, 
my, my, I have a personal mantra and a business mantra. Business mantra, always be amazing. Personal mantra, have fun and make my kids smile. Okay. So uh, I love to do fun things. I am never going to be bored. If you, if you left me on a Sunday uh, with nothing to do and I'm at my home, I'm going to pull out a magic book because I love card tricks and I practice my card tricks. I'm going to take, pick up my guitar. I'm going to play guitar for a couple hours. Uh, if there's an ice rink, uh, I'll go play ice hockey. Uh, that, that's the big sport. Or golf or tennis. Or maybe I'll just take my bike for a ride. There's no reason to be bored. There's so much to do in life. And I'm lucky enough to have found various passions and hobbies that I really enjoy. That, you know, how does that make me successful? I don't think it makes me successful, but it makes me feel fulfilled, which is a personal level of success. So how do you keep you know, your vision and your keep driving forward? You know, you've been doing this now for a little while. So it's been so stressful. You lost all your hair. Um, so uh, Not all of it. You should see what I have on my back. Oh, there you go. That, that, that's the important <laughs> place. So what, um, how do you keep your vision? How do you keep inspired? So, I mean, I just love what I do. I really do. And I think that when you really love it, it's not. So here's the thing. You know, Warwick, you know what you're doing right now. You didn't decide, I'm going to go out and find a job. So I went and looked at a paper. And I know you didn't say, oh, professional speaker, let me call and see if I'm capable of doing that. I didn't interview for this job. You didn't interview. You decided you wanted to do this job. And how many years have you been doing it? Uh, 17, 17. I think after about 17 months, not 17 years, if you'd have figured out that you didn't like it, you would have probably been looking to do something else. So I'm sure you love the idea of wondering when your next job is going to come, the next speech you're going to get. Oh, I love that feeling looking at next year. Boy, I have not enough book, but you know, somehow it always works out. You know, we work hard. I mean, this isn't a job that you apply for. It's a job that you choose to yeah. do. And by the way, I have a number of friends. It seems that I hang around people like this, not just fellow speakers, but other people in business who have chosen to start their own businesses, chosen to do their own thing. Um, maybe that's because I'm not in a company. I don't hang out with a bunch of my fellow employees. So I have to find other people that have the same problem I do. They're not hanging out with their fellow employees. So we're hanging out with each other. But I look around and I say, you know, you've got choices to make and I love what I do. Uh, there are people, m many of my friends who do have jobs working for other companies who interviewed and got the job are very fulfilled and very happy because they work for great companies. But I think as I look at some of my friends, a guy who worked on cars his entire life and ends up in the car business owning, you know, uh, a car dealership. Well, what was that about? You know, mm. he loves it. That's yeah. why he did it. Yeah. All right. So you've been doing this for a while now. You've developed a really great reputation. Looking back, what are some of the things for other people who are starting out on their journey or maybe not as progressed as far, what are maybe two or three things that you wish you'd known earlier? Um, and, and it's probably not going to be magic tricks because you were starting those since about age four. Uh, so what are, what are a couple of things that you wish you'd known earlier to help accelerate that success journey? Wow. So I think the thing is, it's, it, things have evolved. Uh, what I wish I would have had earlier is different than what I wish I would have known earlier because I came into this thing with a tremendous work ethic. Even though I was pretty much less than a year out of college, um, I had a great work ethic. I knew what working hard was all about and I enjoyed what I did. Um, I would say what I wish I would have had back then was the internet and a website and the ability to distribute content at the level that I do today. Yeah. Okay? Because I would be, I don't know how much further along than, you know, because half of my career, there was no internet website. There was no content marketing. Uh, you know, there was none of that. And that's what's making my phone ring today. And that's what's giving me the reputation that I have in business. So um, I think, uh, what, what would I have done differently? I think I would have written a book a little bit earlier. I waited about six years to write the book. And even, I, and I know there's a lot of people listening to this that aren't in the speaking business. I think, well, why would I write a book? I'm, I'm in the insurance business. Okay, well, that's a great reason to write a book. I have a friend of mine in the mortgage business, and he and I talked about how powerful a book could be. And he goes, well, what would it do for me? I said, you should write a book so people know how to get the best rates and how to deal with the mortgage. And when you give this book away and they read this and they see you're the author, they're going to want to do business with you and not your competition. 
think of it as a fancy brochure or an expensive business card. And all of a sudden he goes, wow, great idea. He goes out, he writes a book, he makes, you know, prints up 20,000 copies, self-published, but it looks beautiful, looks great. He's given it away, very well recognized in his business. It has nothing to do with the speaking industry or consulting industry. Uh, I have a friend of mine who's in the IT industry. He actually document imaging. That's an exciting thing to do, isn't it? <laughs> Let's make a copy of this, okay? And, you know, he sells copy machines and things. So he actually sat down with his team and decided to write a book on how to choose the best of whatever the document imaging, you know, the software, hardware, whatever. And he's become an industry expert as a result of that. Yeah. So that's a long version of saying, write a book. <laughs> Three words, write a book. All right. I'm crystal clear on that now. Get that book written. Um, Shep, thank you so much for your time today. It's been brilliant to just chat with you and find out some of the secrets of your success. If people want to get in touch and find out more and get access to some of this content that you generate so much of, what's the best way to get in touch? Just go to my website, hyken.com, H-Y-K-E-N. And if you Google me, Shep Hyken, there aren't many other Sheps in the world, but there's definitely only one Shep Hyken. So uh, you'll find that. Thank <laughs> you so much for your time, Shep. It's been brilliant chatting to you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on the show. You've been watching and listening to the Get More Success show with Warwick Mary from warwickmary.com. Looking forward to having you back here next time. Thanks for listening to the Get More Success show with Warwick Mary. Continue the conversation with other successful people over at getmoresuccess.com. That's where you'll find all the show notes as well as a link to our Facebook group that we'd love for you to join. Getmoresuccess.com is also where you'll find all the information you need to connect with me, your host, Warwick Merry. Thanks for listening, and we hope you can get more success.